Kevin, how good is this flavor? And I said, it's fantastic. I worked with the cats, I know they love it. And he said, no, you're gonna eat some right now, prove it. He made me eat the whole tin in front of the entire sales group. about your parents separately and we'll start with your dad as alcoholism ultimately caused your parents to uh, divorce and he died when you were seven years old can that, you tell us what that was like and how his alcoholism and his death at a young age for you influenced your childhood and your future yeah it was it, it, it's an unfortunate situation um, my mother uh, is a descendant from a Lebanese family and my father was Irish and he was a uh, you know, a gregarious salesman, and uh, they met in uh, my grandfather's company called Kitty's Togs. And it was unfortunate that, that he was, um, you know, a difficult man to live with, obviously. Alcoholism has its issues. Uh, I think he loved his kids, I, you know, I, I believe that, but they ultimately uh, separated and while he was alive. And I think he was very lonely at that point, and he died at a very young age, at 37 years old. So that was very traumatic, obviously. Uh, my mother was trying to, um, you know, re retain custody. And she, in fact, had to go to Europe with us uh, to leave the country. And we traveled around Europe for almost a year, um, going through the legal process of, of separation, which was an extraordinary experience for me. I mean, I went to all those countries at a young age. And ultimately, she remarried um, uh, a man who, who basically fathered me for the rest of my life. He's still alive. Uh, they ultimately uh, settled in Geneva, Switzerland. And, uh, but during the journey, uh, my dad was, um, my stepfather, George, became a member of the International Labor Organization, the ILO, and he was an expert in infrastructure. And so the ILO would go do projects in multiple countries, and he'd get two-year stints in each one. So I've lived in Cyprus, Cambodia, Tunisia, Ethiopia, Japan, Germany, uh, Switzerland, France, you name it, I've been there and um, went through all those different educational experiences in different schools. I met some extraordinary people. I met Paul Pott, I met Haley Selassie, I met Sihanouk. I met them all and, uh, because they were part of the international community. And so we, you know, the expats would often uh, you know, mingle with the government quite often. And so that was, it was a really incredible experience for me um, that I didn't realize was happening at the time. I thought everybody lived that way. And that's what you do when you're a child. You, you assume that everybody's growing up the same way, but in, in, you know, looking back, it really formed uh, how I think about investing, how I think about other people, how I think about other cultures, and indeed the way I invest and travel today. Let's talk about your mom, Georgette. She was a small business owner. She came from a family of merchants. What kind of values did she teach you and how did they affect your future? She believed in personal financial independence. She really, really believed that because she felt helpless uh, during the divorce period and, and that really changed her view of, of, of the way she was going to manage her life and her own money and her own destiny um, and her own investing. And, and she became you know, a great teacher to me about how important it is to take care of yourself and make sure that you're safe and that, that you can then take care of others around you. And she became sort of the matriarch of her sisters and indeed the whole family. She, she was a very pragmatic, disciplined woman uh, about money. Um, she, was, she was very, very liberal in her thinking, which is completely different than I am. Um, and, and yet uh, she, she was a great matriarch. So politically, we didn't agree on anything. But around business and, and family values, she was very strong in that respect. And she always believed in charity, and she, she had a, a great idea of karma. And she'd always say, look, two things. If, if you talk about money and you brag about money, one day you won't have any money. And also, you have to give back. If, if you're successful, karma will get you if you don't give back. And, and I've lived by those, uh, th that, those mantras uh, as she taught them to me when I was a teenager. She also taught you about the value of saving. Let's talk about that in food and exercising at a young age. She really believed that um, you need balance in your life, that you really have to figure out how to live well, take care of yourself, 
She believed in taking 20% of her income and investing it. You know, the, the idea of putting something aside and only spending within your means of, of, of your income. As the executor, I dispersed the money to, to extended family members and it's still around. I mean, my goodness, what a lesson that was for me. And it was after her passing, she taught me something in death. The lesson there is the value of compounding and I think it's important for our younger and even the older uh, listeners and viewers to note, you don't have to be wealthy to save. And if you save and your money compounds over the long term, that is the key. Compounding is the key to financial freedom. Yeah, I, I totally agree with that. I mean, it's geometric growth of wealth. That's what's going on there. What were you like as a kid? Were you popular? Were you a leader? And what did you do for fun? I had a, a different childhood because I was in a different country every 24 months. And so I'd have to remake friends. Um, I, you know, it was... It was and some of these people that I met in those years are, are some of my closest friends today from multiple countries. But we would roll into town, didn't know anybody, um, you know, find a place to live in places like Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. And in Addis Ababa, um, you know, we were in, a, in an expat community, uh, lots of different people from different countries living there, servicing the United Nations or the military or whatever. And for an example there, there were no bicycles. We rode horses. We rode horses in the open plains of, of, uh, of Ethiopia. And, and uh, you know, I just thought that was normal. And, that, and, and it was incredible. I, I remember the first time I ever uh, put a barbecue out when we arrived there. And um, I, I remember it specifically, it was, it was December of 1969. I remember that because the White Beatles album had come out and I received that for Christmas that year. And I was, you know, I went outside and lit up the fire and, and uh, put, put a couple of bar hamburgers out. And when, in, in about five minutes, the sky blackened with giant vultures circling, massive birds, prehistoric looking, you know, shuddering the sun from me. And I, those are the kind of images I remember from, of, of extraordinary outcomes of, you know, living in countries like that. You do not barbecue in Addis Ababa because there are really, really big vultures hanging around. And they, when they smell that meat, they come and get it. That was the nature of, of living as an expat in all these countries. Is it necessary to get a formal education or is it enough to go through the school of hard knocks? Well, <clears throat> I get in a lot of trouble talking about this because, you know, when I finish with you here today, I'm going to Harvard to teach my class, and I, I'm a guest lecturer there uh, to graduating cohorts. And I tell them, I don't remember anything from my education. I don't remember any of the lessons in, in finance or anything from my MBA. None of it. Um, it went in one ear and out the other. But I still know that cohort of people and they have assisted me in my businesses all around the world because they're the leader of banks or they're running industries or they're running companies. The secret to education is not the education. It's the people you meet on the journey. Now, obviously, professors don't like to hear that, but it's the truth. And that's why you do it. That's why you try and, and go to college if you can, to meet those people so that all of these paths and doors open for you that wouldn't had you not had that opportunity. Between your first and second years of your MBA program, you worked at Nabisco, and then after you graduated, they hired you as a, as a brand manager in their cat food brand. Can you share with us how this experience and what you learned there about beef paste and tuna paste contributed to your later success at the learning company and in your career? Yeah, as part of your MBA in the summer, you have to take an internship. That's part of your education. And so I chose a Nabisco Brands um, because I was interested in marketing. And the day I arrived, um, the brand manager there who was Dutch, a really interesting guy, he said to me, um, I'm going to take you to the rendering plant where we make cat food. The, the brand was called Miss Mew and my job uh, for those 90 days was to design a new flavor and get it on the shelf. So the whole idea of cat food is um, the more facings, the more market share you get. 
the more flavors you have on the shelf that are maintained by the grocers. And so when I got to the rendering plant, there was basically two production lines. One was, was taking um, you know, the faces of cattle and chicken faces and, and uh, renderings and, and certain fat off organs. I mean, it was just brutal. And then Sea of, the, uh, sea of, of Japan underbelly tuna uh, that is not sold in premium markets is what makes all of the fish flavors of most cat foods. He, what he explained to me was, look, human beings like to open a can of cat food and have it very uh, stiff so they can turn the can over and drop it into the food plate and it keeps its round shape. But cats like liquid. They want a soup. We've tried to sell soup for the cats, but the people won't buy it. They think they're getting ripped off. So you have to find a balance of making it moist enough so the cat will eat it versus the person that wants to just have a puck there. And we had a plant that had over 500 cats in upstate New York that we would sample all these things. What he was trying to tell me was, you only need two engines. You need the chicken beef mixture and you need the tuna fish. And everything else you just dream up. And that's what I did. And I remember at, you know, at the end of the session, just before I went back for second year of MBA, I, I had to uh, go to the head sales uh, meeting hundreds of sales reps, and um, I learned by fire how that worked. I, I said, guys, I, you know, in order for me to get a good mark on this, you got to get this sold into every grocery store in North America. And the head of sales got up and, you know, in the somewhere back in the room said, Kevin, how good is this flavor? And I said, it's fantastic. I, I worked with the cats. I know they love it. And he said, no, you're going to eat some right now. Prove it. <laughs> He made me eat the whole tin in front of the entire sales group. And later I found out that was what they did to every intern every year. I didn't realize at the time, not the eating it in front of the sales force, but the, 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 what, what the, the head Dutch guy taught me about the two engines. Because that changed my entire life. It's so amazing the lessons you learn that you store in your memory and they bring them back later to apply them in a different way that becomes very powerful. You started soft key in a Toronto basement, a garage, a basement, that's where a lot of companies get going, with two partners. The company was a publisher and distributor of personal computer software for Windows and Macintosh computers, which, like it is now, was a very crowded field with many competitors doing very similar things. What on earth did you know about computers at that time? And what was the aha moment where you said to yourself, there's a need in the market and I want to fill it. In those days, when you, when, you had to sh when you were doing film and you needed the title of, let's say, you know, a hockey player or something, you had to actually create the font and burn it into the film. And I had met a man named John Freeman. He had taken a Hewlett Packard single pen plotter, a device that drove a, a, a pen in an X and Y angle, and he wrote some software to, to actually write fonts, to, to write letters. And I met him in the basement of what was called the Osborne Computer Club. I bought an Osborne computer, which was CPM computer, the first portable computer ever. And he showed me the software and I said, John, that's incredible. That's going to change the world for a lot of people because you're allowing them to do charts and bars and graphs with letters and everything else. Why don't we form a partnership? Why don't, why don't we go 50-50? I'll be the marketing guy, you'll be the programmer, and I'll go sell this software to every single plotter manufacturer all around the world, in Japan, in the US, Germany, you name it. That's exactly what we did. I went to a woman named Mary Zoller, who at the time was the brand manager for Hewlett Packard All Plotters in San Diego, and I met with her and said, Mary, why don't you just give me 10 cents a copy? and put this in every single plotter. And she said, Kevin, very interesting idea, but I'm the top of the pecking order. I can do that anytime I want. Why don't you sell it to somebody else that was one of my competitors first? And she pointed me in the direction of a couple of Japanese manufacturers. I went to see them next, and they said yes. And from no sales at all, we started getting checks for millions of dollars because we're, we were selling it at 10, 20, 30 cents a copy for millions of, of, of 
plotters. And that was the beginning of SoftKey software products. Um, and, and that eventually became the learning company. That started in my basement. And I was, I was traveling all around the world. It was just the two of us in the beginning. And then, of course, it was thousands of employees later on. But it was the idea of OEM bundling. It was the idea that, of marrying the software with the firmware, with the plotter, that was the success of SoftKey software. And then, of course, we became the largest educational software company in the world, the largest reference company in the world. We did Compton's Encyclopedia before Wikipedia. We did all that stuff. And, and I never, never forgot the lesson because I said to my board of directors, I told them the story of the cat food. My thesis was this, let's buy everybody. Because in, 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 in educational software, there's basically two directions that you're trying to go. Math and reading scores. You're trying to advance math and reading scores at children between four and eight years old because that's how they get through high school, that's how they get to college. It's all math and reading scores, still is today. And I said, guys, let's buy every brand and let's just do two engines, one for math, one for reading, and we'll fire everybody else. We don't need all that overhead. We'll just have two, and then we'll add characters like Big Bird, and we'll add characters like Barbie, and we'll add characters like Reader Rabbit, on top of, just like you added the bacon bits to the, the beef patty in, in, the, in the cat food thing, because the kids don't buy the software, the parents do. I mean, our cost of capital went down because our profits went up, our stock price went up, our access to both debt and equity at much higher prices reduced our cost of capital, and we started buying everybody. We, we acquired the entire industry and became the largest educational software company in the world until Mattel bought us because we were actually encroaching on the toy companies too. I owe it all you know, to two people. One was the woman who fired me from Magoo's ice cream parlor and the other was that Dutch product manager who taught me about engines. <laughs> That's what it boils down to. Uh, you took the learning company name uh, when you bought it for $606 million and when that deal closed, you moved the company to Cambridge, Massachusetts, home of Akamai Technologies. And then six years after that, it took six years Mattel to buy you for $4.2 billion. I mean, that's a monster deal, uh, massive home run, but it was soon called one of the most disastrous acquisitions of its time. What happened there? Can you take us through it from starting a company to growing it to all of its challenges and all of its successes to the massive sale and then what happened after the sale? And can you tell us how you bounce back from that? That could not have been fun. No, in fact, um, what, what, what happened was this. The, the, the thesis of the merger or the acquisition, if you want to call it, Mattel was going to buy us. And then we would take their, their big brands like Barbie, for example, and put it into the math and, and the reading engines. And the same with American Girl. And we had demand for those products by the millions of units. And so, when, when I got there, um, I immediately moved to, uh, to L.A. to start working with the product managers to get these projects out because we'd already pre-sold them to Walmart and Target and some of the big distributors all around the world. And my assumption was, as we always could get out a product, we could do it in four months because we already had the engine. We just needed the graphics design uh, and of, the, of the, the doll or whatever it was going to be. So I explained that to the management at, um, at Mattel and I said, look, here's the path, here's the order size, here's what's going to happen, here's the trajectory, here's the target sales. Two years later, we still hadn't released Barbie teaches math or, or Barbie helps you read or teaches typing or anything. The culture was so different. It was so not entre entrepreneurial. A toy company that's been around for 100 years does not move quickly. They had a whole procedure in terms of how to integrate it and, and checks and balances on the brand and everything else. And it was extremely frustrating for me because we, you know, we were trying to harness the entrepreneurial spirit in a very large corporation, which was impossible. It was a pretty big lesson. And you know, in retrospect, that was a huge mistake because you know, we should have recognized that it, would, it, wasn't, going to, it wasn't going to work. And, and worse, there was huge conflict between myself and the board of Mattel because I was, for a while, the largest shareholder they had, personally. I own more stock than most of the board members did. And I just said, guys, this isn't working. And as a shareholder, I'm, I'm unhappy. We've got to fix this. And, um, and I know how to fix it, so get out of the way and let me do it. Otherwise, we're going to lose a lot of value here. Uh, that's not what they did. They fought it tooth and nail. And uh, that was a, it was an you know, important lesson for me. 
Culture matters in a business. And if you're going to sell your company, don't stick around afterwards. Start a new one. You never do it twice. I mean, I'll never do what, that, what happened there again because I, I know to avoid that. That's the whole idea of experience that you wouldn't have seen coming. But yes, it was challenging, no question about it. And uh, later, in later years, in fact, just a few uh, weeks ago, I had, um, I had a lunch with Alec Gore, who's a very famous private equity, uh, one of the big SPAC operators. And that's where he and I met years and years ago because he bought some of the assets. What I eventually tried to do was buy back the learning company from Mattel. And um, they wouldn't sell it to me. They sold to Alec instead. But we've become great friends since then. You said that business is war and that you want to kill your competitors and you want them to fear you and that you want to make their lives miserable and you want to steal market share. You want everybody in your team to think you're going to win. Is business really war? It is. And if you think it isn't, you'll be one of the people that loses. It's competition for the best ideas, the brightest people, the most market share, the most markets, the most innovative products. It's always war. When you get out there, if you don't understand that you are marching to the orders of your shareholders, your employees, and your customers, and you have to win, you won't win. Now, I have nothing wrong with mission-driven businesses. If you want to give a dollar away every time you sell a product or plant a tree, I get it. And that, in fact, is a good strategy because a lot of people care about that or eliminate plastic waste, which I'm a big believer in from my environmental days. But the whole idea is that you have to set some parameters that you have to achieve and you've got to get the whole team following in that direction. If anybody is not agreeing on that direction, get rid of them. They're destroying your culture. Everybody has to agree. And I, what I would do with my management was always say, look, here's the plan for the next quarter. Does anybody have an issue with it? Is there anything you don't like about this plan? Is there something you want to change in this plan? Speak your mind now or forever be at peace because we're going to go achieve this plan. I don't care how, how hard we have to work to get there, or how many hours we have to work, or where you have to go to to make it happen, we're going to achieve this plan because we're going to turn around and tell the street this is what we're going to do and shareholders are going to listen and we're going to do it. And, and I think that is business. That, that really matters. Now, you may not agree with me. Um, I don't know any other way to do it. You need to motivate people. They have to believe in your leadership. They have to want to follow you. And if they don't, you've got to help them find someone else to follow. That's your job. And I would always give great severance packages to people that didn't want to get on board. I just got rid of them. And everybody that worked with me understood the challenges we had and, and faced it. And we worked together to make it work. And we all did well together. That was the whole idea. If you like that video, wait till you see my next one. Don't forget to click right over here and subscribe.